in Houghton, Michigan. So Houghton, I never do this right because I'm trying to do it opposite from like weather, you know, like projection, but Michigan Tech is in the upper peninsula of Michigan, which is practically in Canada. It's surrounded, completely surrounded by Lake Superior. And so we, we do get a lot of beautiful, high quality snow in the winter. So we've been talking about snow and today we had a pretty warm and mellow day. And um, I was sharing that I was outside and I saw half of my neighbor's house just kind of slide to the ground with an enormous thud because it was a lot of, lot of weight of snow. And he actually came running out and he was like, and I'm like, it's okay, your shingles are still there. If it's split off the roof, your shingles, your roof is still there, so, you know, don't worry. <laughs> but it, it's, it's an exciting time of year when the snow starts to recede. And it does, it sort of shrinks back along the banks and it, it shrinks down and back and you know, you end up finding your lawn at, at some point. But Chewy, Chewy, who's our featured speaker tonight, he thinks we're gonna be in for another cold spell because he's lived here longer than me. <laughs> <laughs> and and Junho is located here in Dearborn, right? You know? Yep, that's right. Yes. He says it's snowing there now. Mm -hmm. A big storm or not? Um, a couple of days, yeah, we had a big storm, but right now it's just just small snow at the moment. But so it's still do you have a do you have a snowblower and all this kind of stuff? Oh yeah, I, I have all of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, so no, after, we, after snow, if I, if I go outside, all my neighbors there came out from their home and they're uh, shoveling their snow or uh, snow blowers and all the machines, you know. Um, so we are cleaning the snow driveway. So that's the uh, maybe only my chance to see my neighbor at this time. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's true. It's, it's, it's kind of a, well, it's funny because when we bought the house, we also bought um, the neighbor's snow blower. <laughs> <laughs> No, we bought our like we bought the house, and then after we bought the house, they said, "Oh, and by the way, would you like to have our snowblower?" <laughs> and I, we were like, "Sure," and they're like, "You know, buy it from us." And so we did, and it was the best investment we made. <laughs> oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, no. So Houghton, Houghton, Michigan, is a pretty beautiful place. Um, so so the um, mascot up here is called the Husky. Um, for obvious reasons, because you know, Husky is a pretty useful kind of dog to have up here. And Michigan Tech is known for graduating world-class engineering students. Uh, and so both of our um, co-host and our speaker this evening are both, um, are you both electrical engineers or would you call yourself power engineers? Um, I think electrical engineering is the general and our emphasis is on power engineering. So um, in our diploma, uh, Bachelor of Science and Master of Science, even the doctorate, I think it's all written as electrical engineering. Yeah. And power is sort of like a branch out uh, under the electrical engineering discipline, so. Well, and so your field, kind of like your subfield is power engineering. And that's, that, right. that's been an historic strength here at Michigan Tech um, in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, so it's coming up on six o'clock. So I'm gonna go ahead and, um, I'm gonna, first I'm gonna share some slides if I can make myself do that properly. So thank you everyone again for joining us. It's so fun to have everyone here um, for another evening. As we were saying, it's, it's very, it's beautiful, beautiful day here in Houghton and nice and light and beautiful. I mean, you know, it's nice to be, for it not to be dark at 6 p.m. So um, this evening's presentation is sponsored by the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and you are here with Husky Bytes, which again is a Michigan Technological University webinar series um, hosted by the College of Engineering, and my name is Janet Callahan. I wanna thank the Gregories again, who are matching um, gifts and support of the Michigan Tech Annual Scholarship Fund. And so here's some information about, about how to give if you might wanna support um, student scholarships. And I also wanna point in that if you'd rather designate your gift toward a department or toward a area, you know, athletics, whatever it is, just drop an email to engineering at MTU so we can acknowledge it on Husky Bytes if you wish to be acknowledged. And if you wanna be anonymous, we will acknowledge it anonymously. So we've been, we also post these live on Facebook. Uh, and so if you ever um, would like to join us that way, I just want to point that out to you. 
So this is our lineup in the future. So everyone, we will not have a Husky Bites next week. We, this is our early spring break. Um, we're, we have no session. And then after that, we have seven exciting um, webinars, starting with um, civil environmental engineering featuring the Mackinac Bridge with them. Um, uh, with we're talking about above and below because one is above the bridge and the other one is diving a diving company uh, and so I invite you to join us I think you'll you'll really enjoy it with co-host Audra Morse and that's what's next up and I also um, in case you don't know I would I, you know I don't know how widely this is known but if you're an alum not or an alumnus there is an alumnus alumna um, legacy award and what this means is that your child or your grandchild receives the Michigan Tech resident tuition rate, which is basically a $20,000 a year scholarship. And so um, I encourage you, if you have a son or a daughter or a grandson or granddaughter or, um, uh, or a person to, to check that out. And uh, um, again, next session is gonna be focused on uh, above and below the Mackinac Bridge. And we're really looking forward to that. All right, and so I'm going to stop sharing. And so Chewy, go ahead and start sharing your slides. And what I'm gonna do now is introduce co-host. So I always have a co-host because the technical questions get so complicated that I can't help with them very much. Okay. Um, and so co-host this evening is Dr. Jun Ho Ten, uh, uh, and who is assistant professor at the University of Michigan, Airborne. Did I say your name right? Oh, yeah, that's right, Jun Ho Hong. Oh, yes. Hong. I knew yes. I said something wrong there, there we go. Um, his research area, so he's at the University of Michigan. He's in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. His research areas are artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, power electronics, and energy systems. Juno um, has been at uh, University of Michigan for two years. And before that, he actually worked five years out in industry uh, in the power systems manufacturing field. So Juno is a longtime friend and colleague of our featured speaker this evening, uh, Dr. Chewy Ten. They met at the University of Ireland in Dublin, and I, I'll leave that up to Juno to say a little more. Um, and, and so, um, uh, yeah, Dr. Hong was inspired to go into electrical engineering following two and a half years of service uh, in the South Korean Navy, where he learned a lot about uh, electronics, I believe, and, and, that, and found that pretty inspirational to um, relative to university. All right, and so Juno, I'm going to leave it to you to introduce our featured speaker tonight. Oh yeah, thanks for the introduction, Dean Callahan. Um, yeah, um, so our the speaker, um, Tree Ten. Um, so I met uh, Tree uh, when I was in Ireland, and that's where I started my PhD program. Um, so the, the, that was also my first time when I actually traveled to foreign country from South Korea. So I was so nervous, but and also so many things are new for me. Uh, but, but when I started my PhD program in there, um, I had a chance to uh, have a collaboration with Chui for the first time. And uh, Chui helped me a lot of, um, um, you know, um, the insight why uh, we are uh, looking at the cybersecurity topics for the power systems uh, by the time. Because um, by the time, um, it was almost 10 years ago. And um, nobody actually uh, shared why uh, power system engineers or power system students, they are trying to you know, dig in or studying uh, to the cybersecurity topics for the uh, power systems because this is very new areas. So nobody was sure, but uh, Tree and also our advisor, uh, Professor Chen Ching Miu, uh, we started all these topics all together. And then uh, we solved a lot of um, the problems. We developed many algorithms all together. So I think we contribute a lot for the uh, cybersecurity of power system um, right now. So. Yeah, that was my um, um, the 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 first time that I when I met uh, Chewy in University College in uh, Dublin Island. So, so Chewy, well, and, maybe, and so yeah. Chewy, Chewy Chewy's name is Chi Wu I, but we just call him Chewy here. I don't know if, if that's the exact pronunciation, but it's it's um, it's been my pleasure to be working with Chewy as a colleague for the last three years here. So Chewy, are you? Are you ready to take it from here? All right, you're, you're muted. Chewy is muted. Can you hear me now? You bet. Okay, good. Oh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Jun Ho and Dean Callahan. Um, it has been our great pleasure to present our um, 
milestone that have been uh, since uh, 2006 uh, when I was a PhD student. So what I am going to brief you briefly about what uh, I uh, we were very fortunate to work with uh, Professor Chen Ching Liu group back in, if you know, if you can see the picture here, um, I, is it moving? Okay, there you go. So we actually started uh, back in 2006 uh, on cyber physical system when I came from the industry on SCADA network. And so as you can see, this is a big family here that uh, spent multiple generations of scholars that if you can trace it out all the way to Professor Felix Wu, uh, which is from uh, UC Berkeley at that time. And so uh, June, I started my doctorate in 2006 and Junho started in 2010. So roughly we are about four years for our doctoral program. And our advisor is now at Virginia Tech. Um, we are very proud to be part of this uh, big family. Uh, this has been uh, quite a journey, which I will talk about that next. Um, so I started at Michigan Tech in 2010. And so it's very, uh, I am very fortunate to uh, start with the power program, which is um, historically established because we have a lot of uh, Michigan Tech alumni uh, in base in downstate Michigan. Um, so it's uh, very difficult to have a program like this for many generations. In fact, actually, uh, when I joined, I, I was fortunate to talk with one of our senior uh, uh, colleague, Professor Dennis Wignan, uh, who was still at the time uh, working for our EC department as well. So. These are the uh, students who actually went through uh, defense PhD or going to uh, defense it in a master's degree uh, throughout my uh, 11 year here at um, Michigan Tech. So it's uh, very fortunate to have that opportunity to work with um, multiple NSF, DOE, and some of the projects we have uh, attracted from the federal agency. So uh, thanks to uh, our very competent graduate student that contribute to the body of new knowledge on um, journal papers and all that. Again, this is my acknowledgement space. And I also would like to acknowledge to some of the research experiences for undergrad IEU, because uh, that gives uh, our student an opportunity to try out what research life is looks like and how apprenticeship um, that actually would be uh, for, for life. So before I get into a specific for power system, I want to bring this up deception and gaming because uh, uh, power of infrastructure as a communication system is just a platform, but it, it, what makes it uh, cybersecurity is the people around and it, you can actually look to the, back to 4000 years ago on the Egyptian system where when they designed the tomb and how they've set out distraction and trap on just to uh, the distract the robbery on tombs and set out a few secret underground network. Uh, sometimes they hide the entry or that. And as you can see that also from uh, ancient history of Chinese, uh, that 36 of uh, essay that talk about politics, war and civil interaction, uh, how that uh, deception and cunning uh, in the battlefield uh, that stress on winning, enemy dealing, attacking, chaos and proximity. So what I'm trying to uh, talk about this is in this, uh, emerging world while our technology changes, the human behavior maybe could be also changing into the sense of how our knowledge dealing with the system. But the, the real thing is that how we see this today is related to the, uh, if, if I may just say that uh, we have honey pot, honey net on the cyber system that sort of can distract the uh, intruder that uh, hack into the cyber system as well. So those are the very similar uh, uh, characterization I, I, I said. And the Chinese chess is also often that I always, always play with my peer when I was younger. So that is uh, a lot of strategy, how you come out with that. And, and certainly in the cyber world, uh, when information is accessible from around the world, things are a little bit different in the geopolitical situation too, one time. So I would like to begin with a, a few questions for today's presentation. Uh, help me this, and I don't know how this is going to be. So you, you know, on your screen, you will see that it pop out with question. Uh, the first question is, is United States power grid connected to Canadian grid? So you have two choices, true or false? True or false, that's right. Well, and people are voting. Um, we already have more than 114 participants. And so over, I would say 70% people are voting true. Is this correct? So far. So far. Yes. I don't think it's so going to overturn. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, I'll talk about that at the answer immediately. I think we have the answer, which is 7030 perfectly. Is that right? 70% and 30%. So then the majority win, that's right. <laughs> um, should I mention the solution now? Yes. And, okay. and, and anybody who's taking a poll, you just need to close the poll and it goes off your field of view. Okay. So uh, should I share the result? Maybe I should? You should. I, I share the result. So the, the, here's the result. So yes, you're right. We are actually connected to that. So you look at this map, you see that a lot of those are transmission circuits. So we, in the, we didn't show the distribution system at all because it will be too busy. And transmission is how the generation span through geographically in the different region. And you know this is what we call Eastern interconnection. Texas is by its own. I'll get to that a little bit about recent event. Uh, and then we have Western interconnection. So what you can see is that the reason why we have that interconnection is to have that access of uh, economic generation from different parts of the country um, so that uh, the, we can reach uh, to the consumer and then we can enjoy the uh, cheap rate of the uh, power generation. All right, and while we're here, put your cursor on um, Michigan Tech. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Michigan. And so we're completely surrounded by Lake Superior, that scary yeah. looking lake, yeah. Yes, it looks like an appendix coming up. <laughs> um, but there's a downstate. So Detroit is here. So to tell you how big the state of Michigan is, Detroit is actually the midpoint between Washington, D.C. and where I am, where we are. So, so when I travel uh, on the road, we actually, when uh, enter Michigan, I, I will realize that we just halfway through. <laughs> um, so that's tell you how big that uh, state of Michigan is. And so I'm going to get to do, this map is when this is a recent event, how that weather getting to. So um, the, the things about the Texas is that uh, it was a rare event. And the common commonality of, of uh, event like this is like a cyber attack is also, can be also considered as a rare event. And uh, from a lot of business cases, when we build infrastructure and all that, we build based on what are the likelihood of the event so that we can guarantee the reliability of power delivery, right? So this is a case where um, we uh, make sure that we are prepared and places like here in Houghton, we are prepared for winter. So we have all this equipment getting ready and Texas Unfortunately, a lot of this generating unit, they are not winterized, so make it very difficult to perform at a full capacity of the generation. So as you may know, energy power generate has to be consumed. So if you don't have enough energy, there are certain, certain uh, curtailment of the load has to be disconnected. That's what actually implement uh, in, in the state of Texas is when uh, the other generating unit uh, are operating in, at the certain level, which is maybe uh, seventy-five percent to fifty percent of that, something like that. So that that actually will make things worse uh, to fulfill all the uh, the load requirement. So the second question is: uh, This is so sort of related to a nightmare. Can a blackout power blackout be triggered by a cyber attack? So, how... oh, sorry. Can you can we try again? Well, and so we're seeing it. Yeah, we're seeing the poll. So the question is. Um, um, can or can a, yeah, can a blackout be triggered by a cyber attack? And the two choices are true or false. All right, and, and so far everybody's going for true, everybody. So we have 91 people voting so far. Let's hope they're right. <laughs> so I think we have the poll. Yep. Which is 100%, I think uh, that's correct. So what I'm going to show you next page is, uh, before I get into that, that will lead to the third question. Are uh, the United States power grid vulnerable to cyber attack? And, and maybe are the United States power grids vulnerable to cyber attack? Because there's multiple grids, right? Yes, yes, yes. And uh, you're probably right about that. Multiple grids are uh, interconnection. So the multiple grid uh, connect within the interconnection and form one large network. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I think we're getting close to that. Okay, well, almost everyone agree with a true statement here. So I'll get to that. Um, so release the result. So what originally what we have been doing on power grid security is we deal with uh, weather related problem like tornado whatsoever. So we actually do all this uh, what we so-called contingency analysis and which is uh, n minus one, n minus two, meaning that the number of components, we take one line out and see the grid will maintain is uh, stability and all that. So we do uh, have that tradition to deal with a weather related problem. And under extreme circumstances like Texas case, um, it's very hard to predict. So that sort of thing that uh, can be formed uh, collaborating with uh, um, people who understand uh, geological engineering and um, come up with a forecast technique. And then uh, all, all, and then cyber attack can be also performed from uh, substation as well. So the, all this initial event actually would uh, destabilize the grid that causing potential cascading of uh, outage in the grid and eventually lead to the blackout. So what the last question I want to re relate to, which is in the center of this security is OT and IT conversion. What are the differences between operating technology and information technology security? So I'll feel free to try this. I think this might be a little bit tricky. Right. I'm gonna go ahead and read these off. So A, operational technology personnel can be relay or control engineers. B, OT engineers understand the implication of cyber attack on power grid. C, IT folks manage email and web servers. So what are the differences? D, IT and OT stresses on practice and compliances or E, all of the above. All right, I'm, I'm just gonna go with E based upon my reading. <laughs> I don't know what people are voting. Yep, everybody else is voting E. That's right. I think, I think Chewy, your multiple choice questions are pretty easy. We should all take I think so, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I, I want to make sure that I, I engage the audience easy in the easy way so that people get what I'm trying to uh, convey the message today. And uh, I think from the result, um, the majority win, that's right. So what I you can see from this busy picture is that in any organization, particularly in the utility, uh, you have the IT network, which consists of web server, everything like that. And um, like for, for example, Michigan Tech have I, IT uh, department dealing with our email and our website. And so there is also the another network that could be segregate or air gap. Uh, that connect to the critical infrastructure network, which is we call it OT network. And this OT network is actually connect to multiple uh, substation in the control center, uh, which include the com computer and the IED, which is a digital relay, which I will get into uh, later, that have uh, interaction with a switch gear in substation. So this switch gear is a circuit breaker, how we can uh, send the control signal to electrically dis disconnect the, the certain part of the power grid. So, and then most of the problem of the cyber attack uh, start at the IT network. Um, and, you know, if you have a USB drive, uh, people are getting very nervous when you plug into their network as a guest. Um, this is probably the IT network problem, but uh, the, uh, the intrusion actually most likely it will start here at the IT network. So before I get into that, uh, we recently get uh, a scholarship from uh, NSF about the uh, cybersecurity. So what I think that uh, as the opportunity of advertising of what we have is, we, if you are US citizen or permanent resident, you can apply to this uh, for the two to three years to cybersecurity uh, undergrad and graduate program. And we have a cohort of interdisciplinary researchers uh, between uh, College of Engineering and College, College of Computing. So what I'm showing in this picture is a source circuit um, that everyone can relate to, right? So you look at this uh, outlet and you plug in and if you put too many things on then you could have some issue with that. We, we do have something similar in the transmission uh, bolt power system. So as a result of that, we, we're gonna have a protection system or else this asset in substation that transfer power, large amount of power from one location to the other location is going to be, uh, uh, problem when there is some say tornado walkthrough or some thunder storm situation that will uh, destroy the uh, ten or million of asset in, in substation. So we have that switch gear to handle that. So to give you a picture, assume, assuming that this is the 
uh, uh, power transmission circuit in a simplified version, you will see that there's a tornado walk through a certain transmission circuit. We call it N minus one because our, our all this line segment, we take this one eye out and then we do what if scenario and see uh, what could be a potential problem, right? So the tornado will walk through it and then we run the, our tool and make sure that the uh, voltage is within the range and uh, make sure that other part of the network is not overloaded. Overload will never be good because um, it will uh, implicate a lot of uh, potential cascading problem. As you may know, uh, grid is armed with all this protection device is meant to be uh, electrically disconnect uh, the circuit in a very timely, timely manner so that the, the equipment is not uh, destroyed by the high voltage short circuit. Similarly, we call it N minus two because some tower, as you probably may see that tower two, uh, carry two circuit. So uh, we might do it selectively, but we are not doing this uh, exhaustively because the combination will, for one thing is, uh, can be getting a lot more larger. But at the same time, when you take one eye uh, loud, uh, is, uh, the problem is coming from a better. So uh, unless you presume that there's a storm walking through simultaneously on two different geographical locations, which doesn't make sense, we usually do this in a more selective fashion. So this picture will show you that the typical substation, how it looks like. And uh, in North America, as we connect to the Canadian system and all that, we have tens of thousands of this electric substation that will range from 200 kVA to 765 kV. So to give you a perspective, our outlet is probably about 200 volts. So we have a uh, uh, hundred thousand times or even uh, uh, 300,000 times more because uh, the voltage has to be right so that the proportionally the current will be reduced. And as a result that we will reduce the loss of power transfer from the uh, long distance power uh, from one location to the other. So the process to put all this device on site is very complicated. And these day, because of the communication technology, um, it, we are shifting this uh, into more uh, IP based. So what you see here is that substation automation uh, framework that everything has changed now from electromechanical relay to digital world. Yes, the digital is for the interoperability within different vendors and each substation has a, at least a few dozens of these uh, boxes uh, called uh, digital relay that send the signal to the circuit breaker uh, whenever they send there's a short circuit current so that this breaker will do the job in the man manner of a split second. So substation are sometimes unmanned. So what you see here, substation, they are not, uh, not meaning that they, it's not like a regular office where the utility employee will go there every day. So as a result of that remote access um, remote access is part of the regular maintenance. So that's when the cybersecurity began. Um, yeah, you may, you may wonder how does this substation being deployed, uh, building the substation wiring uh, commissioning, our industrial long time supporter system control have the solution. So um, what they, they are headquartered in Iron Mountain, which is about two hours away and housed with hundreds of their employee working by putting those pieces together. So you can see that this is really a, a long process uh, for factory acceptance tests all the way to site acceptance tests involved in multiple uh, uh, pieces, just like building an aircraft, right? So you're building uh, the substation itself. Um, they also have a satellite office in Houghton and the manager that I've been dealing with is David Rowe who has been very tremendous support for Michigan Tech uh, community and uh, I remember they also provide scholarship for those who are interested in pursuing power engineering as well. Um, they uh, might hire you upon graduate if you're interested, who knows. Um, we, we have a pretty uh, a, a fantastic placement rate for power engineer in our EC department. So to put it in uh, context, everything changed to digital, right? So what you see here is a, a little complicated uh, situation. What I'm going to show you on the HMI, which represent the computer and all the blue box I just show you is a uh, IED uh, that actually come from this level that connect to a different part of the switches. So there will be a lot of this uh, blue box in the substation and um, communication between control center and up, other substation is also enabled now this day. So uh, what you see here uh, is a standard communication protocol called IEC 61850. Uh, the reason we need to have a standard is for interoperable 
uh, purpose. So what they usually do is that, for example, Schweizer is a ma ma major manufacturing for uh, substation relay. They could also have a GE and so as many other uh, vendor out there. So for, in order for them to be able to communicate easily, uh, a standard has to be uh, established. Otherwise, um, you will have to buy a device from one vendor and then uh, and then you can't find a second vendor to for fixing the issue because uh, using the because of the proprietary uh, information uh, communication. So for the communication from a substation to control center, we have the power grid. Um, it's like um, Houston, we have a problem, but not exactly that. Uh, we are monitoring all the substation coming from the uh, for, from uh, the, from the substation to the control center. And here's uh, where they um, centralize the data coming from substation with hundreds of power substation. Uh, it is a very busy um, time for the schedule with multiple shift. So they usually have a primary and a backup control center in a different geography. Um, so we are talking about a trillion dollar of access, access uh, in, in uh, in, in, in a different geography. So for us to do research, it's almost impossible to build everything in the back. Yeah, so we have to rely on certain communication. So uh, what we have eventually, uh, initially we start with the dispatcher training simulator and now is everything getting more digital. So in order for us to do simulation and all that, we will need uh, something called the RTDS. And I believe that Jun Ho have something developed too in at University of Michigan, Dearborn on the RTDS device so that, you know, we can test our algorithm with the software and um, making sure that things uh, operate as uh, what we would like to. And um, this is a big uh, advancement for our power community because of the computing advance on both software and hardware. And um, that we can actually emulate, emulate a different part of the system from uh, as the RTU feeding into this green bo uh, blue box. Um, the latest trend is uh, Chinese uh, researcher for power engineering. I think they are emphasizing on the faster than real time, meaning that they want to uh, know uh, the foreseeable future, uh, what the grid is going to look like given a current con condition. And, and also a lot of initiatives going around the country on the digital twins, um, meaning that instead of building the substation itself, we actually can use software and hardware uh, to emulate, emulate and characterize the power grid behavior on circuit breaker tripping, uh, et cetera. So I mentioned uh, that security is something that we uh, has already been in the blood of power engineer. If you look at this figure, it looks like a little bit, oh, it's coming from the 1967. We use the word security as power system security as in the sense of the figure I just shown to you, N minus one. So uh, security could be like, you know, you, in a different technical community could be a very different definition like financial security, uh, information security, power system security is uh, very different. And then now we have cyber security. So, um, so the security term that we have originally from uh, the past have shifted more on reliability uh, context uh, as co uh, opposed to the N minus uh, one uh, cybersecurity, what we are trying to promote here. So you can see that whether or not the grid will be in secure or insecure state. And then there are some remedial actions have to be safe from the emergency condition. Um, so those people who are in the control room, they actually do control uh, recommend, recommended by the application uh, so that uh, they will save the, uh, the grid from being collapsing. Um, these are also the state of the app uh, uh, in 1967. We talked about state estimation, how we run the um, online load flow analysis. All this is coming from uh, the application standpoint, feeding the data, real-time data measurement from, uh, from the site. Um, so this picture also show that we have uh, now, not only the physical part that have SCADA information, but we also have to establish some of the uh, anomaly in the cyber system. Particularly, we want to get to know about um, the footprint of the attacker. If uh, they, are, they are foul play between the system, we want to capture that uh, into the system. So we published that uh, framework uh, back in about 11 years ago, uh, how we can relate alarm processing data with the cyber anomaly together and correlate the what if scenario. So 
the what if scenario paradigm is basically say, if you lose this, if you do lose that, what will happen to the grid? And what about other possibility as well? So the framework is actually trying to uh, promote um, the correlation, not just on the grid operation standpoint, but also if uh, there could be uh, uh, potential foul play happening between the substation control network, as you probably may have heard that most of the substation are, are men. And so uh, right now the Federal Energy, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is trying to promote incentive for all the uh, utility users to be able to use that system, uh, promote using anomaly detection frame, framework in the, in the substation level. Um, so this is a work done by Jun Ho. Uh, I think that they, uh, what he's trying to do is uh, to peel up the gap on the last word that we had uh, suggested about 11 years ago by trying to pull out all the data, alarm blocks and see and if there's any violation from different part of the substation and then try to correlate the event. The last thing that we want to avoid is uh, the circuit breaker is open and we have no idea what's going on, right? So this is a really uh, the uh, situation that had happened back in Ukraine power grid cyber attack where the operator in the control room have, um, realized that the circuit breaker has been open and they thought that it was maybe a weather related problem until they realized later that it was a cyber attack. So what we are trying to do here is that to promote the anomaly detection framework to alarm the operator in the control room that uh, there are something going on in the substation and it's not well coordinated and this could be something happen uh, in, in, in the substation. So we also uh, work with a lot of different uh, uh, research around the country with uh, utility as well, trying to understand that and we realize that a lot of this, uh, this uh, cybersecurity framework for power grid is, is gradually gaining the uh, understanding about the significant threat of this uh, issue. Um, so uh, this is an existing practice about how this authority of federal level with the regional level, uh, working with a utility for complying the NERD CIP. Uh, unfortunately, the NERD CIP doesn't have that kind of specific language to uh, promote how, but rather uh, mention to UT what they should look into uh, in terms of uh, uh, cybersecurity protection in their substation network. And there are a lot of this uh, security technology out there. They want to promote uh, their software, but uh, having a hard time to pitch because there's a communication gap between vendor and utility. Um, I think from the standpoint of CEO of the utility, the utility they want to get to know if uh, uh, this can uh, help them to enhance the reliability of the power delivery. But the vendor will keep saying something about how great their firewall is. So that's a big mesh uh, uh, gap in between, between the communication. So what we did on this NSS proposal is promote a incentive model by gathering the data. Uh, so hopefully that will bridge that uh, business opportunity between the utility and the vendor at the same time uh, to be able to introduce a data analytics um, from the vendor perspective to the utility. And hopefully that um, you, the utility will be able to see what's going on between the substation um, as well. So in terms of the risk number, we can sort of uh, think about how can we co uh, gather all this uh, system violation and security uh, uh, issue from the uh, each substation computer system, right? Um, think about this as a bigger um, standpoint, how we can gather anomaly from the switching actions standpoint with uh, the, the neighborhood of the control center standpoint and then the trend. Uh, all this uh, recent uh, base related uh, data can be also put it together. So what we are trying to achieve uh, for this project is to put all the model together because power system engineering, we already have some mature model uh, tool that we can actually use. The only difference between the cyber uh, security problem is we can uh, initiate a different initial event that will ca can cause a larger outage. So we come up with a cyber risk model that basically uh, put the data into and see uh, if this happened, what will happen to the grid and how long the grid will take to restore back to the normal. What will be the economic impact or cost uh, for the hypothesized uh, cyber attack on a certain substation. And then we create uh, the issues on 
uh, the model of the ruin probability and then calculate the premium for cyber insurance. So this is, again, I'm using the same figure. Uh, for NERD CIP, they mentioned about the impact, anything more than three gigawatts. So what you see, 3,000 megawatt is actually three gigawatt. Um, so uh, that correspond to each other interconnection. So you can see that uh, Texas have a total load of 60 gigawatt. Uh, um, the maximum is about 70 gigawatt. So it's about 5% of that for three gigawatt. Uh, for Western interconnection, I think is about 151 gigawatt. And then the Eastern, of course, is the most uh, interconnected uh, with, uh, with uh, a lot of control area. So we have about 560 gigawatt. And this number will only trend up because uh, the, the direct correlation is that when the population of the country grow, then the consumption of energy will grow. So as a result that we have to uh, think about how to grow the generation and and possibly increase the uh, uh, new uh, transmission circuit so that uh, there won't be any congestion in the transmission circuit. So this is a diagram I, I am always uh, intrigued to use it to talk about uh, my personal experience. So um, the, in fact, this is published by National Economy uh, in 2013, talk about the resilience of the power grid delivery and in response to uh, terrorism and natural disaster. So what is essentially say here is that in the 90s, uh, you have all this computer system, personal computer, getting more advanced with today now with uh, uh, physical impact. So what you can see is that you have a sabotage on physical system. And then uh, gradually, uh, the attacks is getting more sophisticated uh, uh, as of today. So I. Remember when I was a student at uh, Iowa State as an undergrad student, I have a dormitory uh, a roommate. He showed me one day and told me, Chewy, you know, take a look on these two computer uh, console. On one computer sc screen, he showed that there is a sophisticated, uh, some looks like a Trojan host uh, with a lot of button, eject CD, delete file and all that. On the other screen is the infected uh, computer with that Trojan, uh, Trojan host. And what he's showing me means that while he's uh, using his uh, the other console click on eject PC, the other computer uh, CD-ROM was eject. And you know in the 90s, that was kind of scary. Imagine that your uh, CD is eject by someone else that's connected to the internet, right? Um, so when as we get more and more, then we have ransomware. It also uh, happened to my family business that you know you had to use a bitcoin to pay that amount at that time uh, i think it happened in the early um 2010 or something uh, with my dad uh, business uh database that's been encrypted and then that ransomware prom on and say do this if you uh i will delete all your database right so that that is uh one part of the ransomware and then now it's further more sophisticated so i'm sure that uh this cyber physical system security will get more complicated. And then people will accept that this is a new normal we actually live in because if you look at um, drone, um, there are some researchers around the country can play music by orchestrating with the drone flying around and play music. Um, I, I was trying to imagine that what if this drone is coordinated in a certain fashion that creates short circuit in substation. So those sort of, uh, event could be plausible today because if you talk about things like that uh, last uh, maybe 20 years ago people would think that this is bizarre and it's not really uh, uh, things that is uh could, can happen right but with today what we have uh, in the cyber system is can be uh pretty uh, uh it can happen you know so this is a summary of the Ukraine power cyber attack is that it actually starts from the malware, how it propagate and going through a different system and then eventually get to the, into the system. So the, the shit area I highlight here is basically show that the path that how malware was propagated and get into uh, the, eventually the system of the OT network. So the IT is um, not so much, but the OT is actually the one, the computer system that have direct relationship with circuit breaker and power grid. And uh, this is uh, really getting uh, very scary sometimes because um, the ransomware and the IP-based routable communication has been introduced in 
uh, power control system. So a, a little bit of background of the intrusion. So we all know that at this point, intrusion electronically from one location to the other is possible, right? Um, so if that's the case, then we are trying to think about all the possible uh, scenario, what would be the spectrum of attack vectors and what can be a attacker motive and system adversary. So electronic intrusion itself is not really scary, but it's what's scary about is uh, if that SCADA network is being compromised and how uh, this uh, attack is being done to uh, cause some damage in the physical system. So what I showed you before, there was an N-1, N-2, now we have N S minus one, meaning that if the attackers head into a substation that have connect to uh, 14 line, this is way more than what we uh, have presumed in our original design of the circuit, which was N minus one, right? So this can easily translate into N minus 14. And, and what happened is that if the attacker can happen uh, get into multiple substations at the same time, it become a very combinatorial challenging uh, problem to begin with. But at the same time, it can totally can initialize uh, the grid and probably uh, cascade the grid into blackout. So when I create the animation of grid, something like a grid looks like this, when uh, operator in the control room see that this uh, substation is being de-energized, and the R1 is being and the energy. And the, when things happen like that, the SCADA alarm will send information back to the control room and alert these people who are working for multiple shifts. And what you see here is uh, there were multiple phone calls coming into a control room. And then eventually that cascading may cause, uh, which is a protection system because of the imbalance system will kick in and do uh, adjustment of that and eventually it will cause the blackout. So this is a, the physics part doesn't change, but the event, the initial event can change due to the cyber attack. So what you can see here is that the cyber physical system correlation is that um, the regular maintenance and uh, who lock into the cyber system, the hundred of substations do maintenance. The attacker can uh, lock into the system and plan things out and discover things more from the local console, which have a complete access to the switch gear in that particular substation. So you can see that uh, the plot of the attack can be done. Thankfully that the attacker, if they compromise on only one substation, they only have control on uh, that substation, but they don't have a control for all the substation in the control, uh, in the control area. So that's the limitation, but uh, things could have changed. So we did actually, uh, in our original research back in 2008, is that we, we sort of take one substation out at a time and see what will be the impact of the grid and then use that um, stochastic pattern to model the intrusion behavior from the outsider to get into the uh, SCADA network and then tabulate the number uh, on one side is about the impact, on the other side is the probability of this cyber event that translate into the potential intrusion of success. If we multiply by this product, which we introduce as part of the risk, and we calculate that risk uh, co correspond to each substation to control center. So that was uh, back then about uh, the research on cyber physical system. And then what we did was we increase uh, the combinatorial evaluation because um, we believe that um, the system should be studied based on the different combination. So just like what you uh, walk on the bridge, you look back, you see the footprint, of, uh, the, your, your foot on the sand. We want to be able to have something like that to capture different part of the system um, so that to be able to capture the footprint of attacker who actually trying to discover and try to head into one layer and after another layer. Um, this is, was a, a, a few years later that uh, we published to talk about how to systematically uh, um, the correlate the substation. And once we have a certain set of substations we can correlate, then we can do the combinatorial evaluation on the impact on the uh, physical system itself. So we did, uh, find out the number of M, which is a malicious substation, 
And we can do this uh, in real time to evaluate a, combina a combination and find out what will be the priority uh, in case something happened, uh, what are the uh, Romandel action need to be done to save the system from uh, collapsing. Uh, in this case, uh, we don't want blackout. So the algorithm, what we did on, on this work is trying to enumerate all the combination and try to find out the impact correspond to uh, M select K. And then we get more and more into the total combination. And then eventually we find out that the total combination and the reduced combination, and we will be able to find out what is the higher impact among all based on this I2 3 bus system. So from this movie, uh, by the way, my daughter and I love the Miles movie. So I thought that on this uh, shot on the uh, scene in Infinity War, you remember that uh, Dr. Strange told uh, uh, Iron Man that uh, I have, he went to see what is the alternative future and see possible outcome of the potential conflict. And then uh, he said that they were 14 million combination. And then later on, he said that how many they win? They say only one of them. So that lead to the uh, lifetime highest grossing movie in the uh, history, which is the end game. Um, uh, so those are the storyline I think it intrigued me as a researcher because if we know, if we have a model we have in our mind, if we hypothesize a problem will start at certain substation, we can actually do a lot of combinatorial evaluation and eventually it will get into a certain part of the system that we want to see, oh, which of the substation have uh, more frequency, let's do investment of uh, more cybersecurity protection into that instead of building more transmission line, which uh, make no sense in security planning. So the, the, what have changed so far from 11 years ago and to, to today is that this substation, we presume that it centralized to a control center, one way or two way, between the substation, there is no communication. Uh, it's not very true now this day be the facial measurement unit that we have uh, a gateway to share information among uh, different substation itself. So um, that also implied that intrusion can happen because of the IP routable communication uh, basically is just protected by a firewall and all that. So in terms of combinatorial event on the worst case scenario, um, you can imagine that intrusion can happen with a different substation uh, shown in this picture. You can say that um, the attack may run simultaneously on the three location, the energized three location or four location. And we might ask ourselves, how can we do uh, better to capture that which substation have the most problematic issue so that when we introduce some security technology to certain substation, it will help us to save a lot of trouble. So th those are the total combination we are going to com uh, consider the more IP-based solution is deployed in the substation, right? So we come up with an algorithm to be very systematically to come out uh, the merger of the different uh, segment, which we call it uh, the reverse pyramid model. Um, we put it together of a combination and get the worst case coming from the each segment and then put it together. And then we, if we find out from a smaller test case, a lot of this combination with the different algorithm that lead to the same uh, uh, combination case, and then we uh, use this uh, study to promote into a different substation. So we actually make this uh, combinatorial evaluation to those different substations and see what could be the potential problem. And, and then we realize that there are certain substations, they always have an issue. So um, this also imply if, if uh, a utility owners see this as a problem, they probably will put the best cybersecurity technology investment on those substations because if the attacker manipulate the circuit breaker on those substations, once they successfully head into the substation, uh, it can cause a lot of trouble, in, meaning test scaling problem may, may lead to the blackout. Um, this is the same thing we try with a different algorithm, random breakfast, first, that first search, and then the same thing consistently show that as well. So we actually refine that model. We say, well, we want to get to the next level to see uh, we can capture the cascading behavior. And, and then by just presuming that a substation is compromised with the electrically, electrically disconnect from that substation, we want to see the implication of that. 
So this paper, we, we improve the model and then with the cascading outage, we take that line out again. So you can see, we take this out, we take that line out and see if the power flow converts or not. And then we enumerate all the possible combination at a given system and run this sim simultaneously. As you can see that we actually start from the 14 bus system, which is the smallest to 300 bus system. As you can see, when you do uh, n select one and select two uh, for different system, the, the combination will grow exponentially. So what we think that using the algorithm, we do uh, reductions of the filtering, what will be the worst case and run the simulation. In fact, that uh, one of my students actually run the, our superior computing with a, a lot of parallel computing into the script and run it in a few days and figure out all this result as well with a respect to this system, what are the combination? So these are the picture uh, show the complexity of line segment for all part of the United States. As you can see, it's a very complex interconnected. So what uh, is shown on this picture is that if the, uh, let's say ITC, uh, ATC is here, that's a Florida Power and Light and it's a Southern company. Those are the transmission company, they are actually interconnected to each other. So whatever happened uh, on one side, it can actually uh, propagate to the rest of the system if uh, system instability occur. So interconnection is really the, uh, the key is that uh, how uh, one system will affect each other and coordination could be an issue. If you look at 2003 blackout, um, there's a, a issue between the two countries of us. Uh, Canada has issues, uh, Ohio have issues, and everyone is worrying about their own control area. And sometimes the coordination in the wider uh, broadened sense, it wasn't captured in the control room because the control room only have the individual information on their territory, right? So you see that uh, at, it is an interconnected system. So uh, when you have big system, there's always uh, uh, issue with the coordination, but when you have small issue, uh, you could, could also have issue uh, as well. Um, so what we think that in the wait, future- wait, I'm, I'm gonna jump in. So are we, are we close to the end? I, I think so. Yeah, we're getting close, very close to the end. Okay. Yes. So to, to sum up, what we are trying to do here is that combinatorial evaluation uh, is one thing. There is a lot of uh, work that we have to do in planning for power grid because of uh, this IED, as I mentioned earlier, that's connect to different part of the system and a substation uh, uh, schematic can be very complicated with a lot of different breakers. And so these are the computer, if they uh, if went to the wrong hand of the people, it can actually trip the circuit breaker and, and de-energize certain part of the grid. So we are working on this model to find out the combinator of the IED model. Um, how is that relate to us in this picture? Um, so um, I'm sure that a lot of you will have uh, some device like you know Amazon uh, Alexa or Google uh, Home and all that. So we are the individual actually connect to uh, this distribution system. So one feeder actually would connect thousands of different customer. And what will happen in the future is that this is a mobile phone that we have if those internet-based communication system is being compromised in the cloud and the control action was sent through that cloud to the, your home uh, automation system and send a disrupting uh, switching action to those device, it can actually initialize the instability in the grid if that is large enough to the transmission system. And it could actually um, cause some uh, large outage in the system as well. So I'm just uh, trying to think uh, and imagining this law um, to see that how this is uh, going impact to us because while the OT network is not really the public network, the IT network is, and so as our home automation, uh, home uh, internet, and so as our workplace is all internet, right? And we are using this cloud system to automate our home uh, with a simple uh, Alexa framework. And that's how we're going to uh, turn off all our light in the house. And that could translate into a sudden reductions of a load, electrical load for individual. And then you think about a thousand of them has been uh, controlled through the cloud. Uh, it will have certainly the same effect as the circuit breaker is open. 
So today distribution grid is going to change as you see that it's a radio fashion uh, into a tomorrow network is highly mesh, highly shared network with, and, and who knows that with the, the Tesla is going to get into our home with a lot of uh, home energy management system. We might be able to sell our power to our neighbor uh, in the foreseeable future. And because of that internet space communication, um, it also introduced a lot of issues that we have to deal with uh, that uh, include um, how to protect our uh, system at home so that uh, the, the people from the other continent will not send a denial of survey attack to our home and bring our system down. So, but that's gonna require a collaborative uh, effort and um, that um, I think that uh, we as a community of Michigan Tech, we are very lucky to have a very research active cohort on campus and how we can uh, strengthen our reach out to the colleague in the different college and department to work on interesting collaborative research. So um, with that, this is uh, what I have for today. Okay, I followed most of it. I, I wanna say I followed most of it and, and uh, I'm, over, I'm actually really impressed. I mean, it's like a two decades or, or maybe even 25 years worth of research. So <clears throat> if you've been listening, I want you to understand this is probably maybe 10 to 15 PhD students theses that you just saw kind of all together. So if it, if it sounded like a lot, it's because it was a huge um, amount of work being presented, including the work of Juno Hong. I saw one of the papers you referred to, Chewy, as being a, a, a joint paper with, with Junho. So if anyone has questions, please feel free to load them into Q&A. And already I can see there's 12 questions loaded into there. And Junho, you know, please feel free to, to select some questions and help me kind of handle these. We have a couple of comments. Um, to, uh, you know, um, I guess, um, you know, there's a couple of questions about Texas. You know, I thought Texas was not connected. And so if we have time, we can answer that. But, um, but maybe we can take one from, from John uh, at first. What, uh, what should a high school student study now to get into a university cybersecurity program or a power engineering program? What computer games might they be playing? Uh, and, uh, and then there's a question about hockey. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know you want to start so, first? I mean, oh, I would yeah. take a stab at that. Take your math, enjoy your math, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I think in engineering, uh, math is the tool to be successful. And, um, and, and also being able to um, work on the challenging problem is another thing. Um, I don't know, if I look back to the route where I went through, um, I wasn't really planning to study power grid. <laughs> it's the mentors that I met along the way changed me. The mentors, and, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. mentors um, from the sophomore year to junior and senior. And uh, it, there could be professor who is very bad in the classroom to teach uh, the instruction, but um, engaging in research, uh, undergrad research, it certainly helped because, uh, you know, uh, sometimes you get an intuition from what's going on out there. And I wasn't uh, quite sure at the time because I came to an United State, I, I would say, to study computer engineering. And uh, in 1997, we had the financial crisis. Just to manipulate the currency, so uh, I have no other choice. My dad gave me a pot of money and said, "Well, you can only study this much of a, a, a year." So I had to change to electrical engineering, which had required shorter um, pre pre -rad. So, mm -hmm. and I decided to say, um, since we have a pretty good power program, why why don't I just uh, try it out? And then I met my first. Uh, uh, instructor there and he was very kind to engage me to study uh, power engineering. In fact, he hired me for uh, the master's program as uh, to write a thesis. So uh, I was very thankful of him uh, for that opportunity that connect me to uh, the top notch researcher of the country. Um, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of us were very successful uh, today still and, and uh, make me who I am today. Well, and so, Chewy, your, your playfulness, you know, inserted itself across the presentation. So Junho, do you see any questions you might want to um, help answer or like read out or contribute to the answer? Um, 
Yes, maybe I can answer the question from Harry. So whether the IEC 6150 is the, uh, the standard that we are using in the US many utilities or is there any other uh, standard like international standard for US? So basically, um, as Chui presented in this um, 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 the presentation, this IEC 6050 is one of the international standard for the substation automation systems. However, um, in US, we have a uh, Department of, of Energy, the government agency. Uh, they are actually started and initiated one of the another um, the the standard that uh, many US utilities they are using for the uh, communication standard, which is Open FMB. So this is more like a utility driven um, the US space, you know. Uh, the standard activities for the US. And however, for the in, if you look at the more big picture, like uh, international, including European countries and Asia countries, then IEC 6050 standard is more uh, general uh, substation automation standard for the uh, data structure and modeling and even communications. So hopefully this, this can help you to uh, have more um, ideas. Well, and, and from <clears throat> from John, um, just uh, kind, of, kind of some comments about about um, a degree from Michigan Tech with a specialty in cybersecurity for electricity grids. So then he went on and looked it up, and the, the salary ranges are between about eighty and one hundred and fifteen thousand um, dollars. And uh, I mean, this is as you can see because of the scholarships you showed, Chewy, right? Many multiple mm -hmm. scholarships you can get your college paid for and earn a really high wage in, in, in these fields. So um, yeah, no, I um, I think it's pretty cool your career story into it because it was about kind of taking advantage of opportunity and um, uh, and uh, and then executing on it. And uh, you know, I think that's, I think those of you who are out there listening who don't know your career path, it's about paying attention to opportunity and listening to, you know, what you might be interested in. and that kind of thing. You yeah, see, and, uh, go ahead, Junho. Oh yeah, maybe I can have one more comment for this because after my graduation, I actually was working in the industry for five years. And uh, during those five years, I, I saw a lot of opportunities uh, about the cybersecurity for the power system or smart grid uh, for this kind of you know critical in infrastructures. So this is because um, now, well, if you look at the um, like a critical infrastructure devices, they are all having the communications. So because we are having more and more communication into the devices for the critical infrastructures. So now the vendors, whenever they are um, they are selling those products to their utility or customers. So now they need to think about the cybersecurity problems. So this is where uh, we can see you know huge openings for the job markets. So after your graduation um, from the electrical engineering, if you are doing the, some cybersecurity research uh, during your undergraduate or graduate um, the courses, then you know once you're going into the uh, industry, then you can see huge benefits from there. Because if you just do the electrical engineering and working on the power systems and those, you know, the traditional research or educations, and without any um, like a communication or cybersecurity related. Um, um, the topics, then uh, you may not have to get those chances once you're going into the industry uh, areas. So maybe that's another uh, good point uh, if you're doing uh, cybersecurity um, education or research. Well, and so there's a, a few questions about home security. So this question is from Margaret. Um, several, several, so this is maybe for Chewy. Several times security issues were mentioned with the home automated systems like Alexis and Google Home, should these be avoided or is there a way to lock them down? And I want to know, how do you protect your home? Both of you guys, you have to answer that. Well, the first thing you have to think about is what would be the worst case scenario? In our design, we always think about worst case, right? Um, worst case scenario in this case is uh, my lights got turned off all, all of a sudden. And I mean, would that impact me? Maybe. Um, will my credit card information be stolen? Maybe not, right? And, and so um, in my house, I have a, a few dozen of the switches. It's now IP based. So I can say uh, uh, Alexa and then I turn off entire house. It will do it for me. So uh, it, for one thing, it's convenient, right? For the other thing is uh, 
what if you get to the wrong hand of people and how you're going to protect that? Um, I, I don't think this is a simple question respond to that um, because you know it's the same thing for what we deploy on the IP based solution to um, this substation solution because uh, it's, it's the trend thing. Everyone is using that because uh, for the part of that, uh, it creates a lot of convenience and, and quality of life. But at the same time, if someone uh, hack into the system and maybe turn off continuously, on, off, on, off, maybe I will get annoyed out to shut down my firewall. <laughs> but um, I, I haven't got the experience that uh, the computer system is being hacked and uh, do something really bad. Um, so think well, about I, Juno, do you have anything to add? Oh yeah, basically uh, one of the easiest way to you know prepare to the cyber cyber attacks in your house internet is basically you can actually turn off your uh, wireless signal names. So for example, if you're going into your router configurations, then you can actually hide your um, the 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 Wi-Fi names. So that way you can only access those network if you know the name of your wireless um, the, the the connections. So maybe that is one of the easiest way you can uh, prepare for the uh, cyber attacks. Yeah. How do you hide your Wi-Fi name? Um, if you go to the routers, some routers, they are actually supporting uh, that kind of configurations. So if, if somebody knows your IP wireless network name and password, of course, they can go in into your network, right? However, if you don't know and how to see you know, your Wi-Fi names, there's no way they can actually access to your network. So you can actually have one more barrier against cyber attacks. Uh, but what if I forget my own router name? Um, then since you have physical access to your router, so what you need to do is uh, you can actually connect, you know, wire your connections, like even a cable to your wire router, then you can find out. <laughs> yes. That's All right. <laughs> Let, let's take a couple of quick Texas questions. Can someone elaborate on the power conditions that happened in Texas recently, asks Manzi. Manzi Gurdar. So um, my understanding for this issue is that uh, Texas is not, majority of Texas is not you know, connected to the Eastern or ne uh, Western interconnections. So, so, and then the event of the snow that actually uh, the, the part of the country never be ready to be winterized, mm -hmm. actually restrict the uh, capacity of the uh, grid that will operate. So as I mentioned, uh, power generation will meet the demand, electrical load. So if you have 500 megawatt for the load, generation had to make 500 megawatt to meet that demand, right? But in some case situation when the de uh, generations cannot fully uh, commit to that due to uh, some issue, in this case, uh, some of the generating unit cannot perform um, more than 50% because of the site is not uh, winterized. And because of that, they have to uh, shut down um, some of the site system and uh, at the that cause adequacy issue. So in power engineering, we use the word adequacy, meaning you have load, you have generation, they both, they both have to be met in real time. If a, we have a load of 500 megawatt and we only have uh, 300 megawatt generation, we got a problem. So that 200 megawatts deficit is whether or not you're going to introduce some ancillary service, which is a lot more expensive, or you have to cur curtail the load, which mm. means a power outage, right? So that simple physics, physics there. There is a saying that uh, in the discussion I've been paying attention to is, uh, they mentioned that this scenario might have changed if Texas is connected to uh, the Eastern interconnection and Western interconnection, this might not happen. We, we don't know about that because, you know, that depends on a lot of other things and uh, the capacity of the transmission circuit is transferred to and whether or not uh, there is a, a enough just in time generation to meet that abrupt change of load. Because, uh, you know, as I said, generation has to meet the electrical load, not the other way around. And so that deficit is actually causing an issue. And certainly there are some things even worse uh, happening around the system that probably will have to go through the rotational power outage. Um, very similar to Japanese uh, situation, if you look at the nuclear, uh, the tsunami in Japan, mm -hmm. when the tsunami uh, shut down some of the big nuclear power plant, plant 
and they 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 have a uh, issue with adequacy because uh, power is just not enough to meet every electrical load. So they they went on rotational power outage around the island country as well. So adequacy is the real thing, and you can relate this issue by uh, talk about political science, uh, talk about some other marketplace. Um, of course, that's going to be a research topic, but uh, the intuition is simply we just don't have enough generation in in in. In, in Texas at the time. Well, and so um, Margarita um, Das um, kind of asks a, a question about um, about when you when a person is able to start research in the field of computer engineering. And so I just want to kind of point out there, there's of course the Bachelor of Science in Computer Engineering or Electrical Engineering, the Bachelors, right? That's that's what you know a four year degree, and then there's a Master's. And a PhD, and so, so you don't need a master's to earn a PhD. You can just earn a PhD. And I speculate that the that one needs a PhD in order to do research in these fields. Would you? Would is that true? Do you, Do you guys think to uh, do research? I, I think the a lot of hands-on research start at at least master's thesis uh, to get a warm up experience. Right, you gotta get warm up and. Research is a very interesting uh, concept. Uh, to me, when I was undergrad, I have no idea what research mean uh, in, no. in, yeah. in, in certain degree. And uh, the best way I, I, how I would put this is, is like, if you like cooking, you enjoy cooking, you have a recipe, you have to revert first to be able to reproduce a recipe of the things that you want to cook, right? Mm -hmm. And then you suddenly realize that this might meet well the other taste. So you start putting, adjust, improvise the recipe and you discover this recipe you, um, you invented is actually very good than the original one. Mm -hmm. So that process, try and try and error and lead to the, the end of the study discovery of that is, is research. So that could be sometimes very lonely process because uh, for first thing first, you have to have be able to reproduce um, like sometime in research you were given a paper and then researchers will have to read and understand the methodology of the research and try to reproduce the result. And once they are comfortable about this process, then they can say, I can do this better, right? So uh, they mm -hmm. change it to that. Um, at least from the system engineering perspective, this is the case. Uh, in other uh, cases that requ require a lot of lab work, I, I think the process might be similar. I, I could be wrong. Well, and so I'm going to give you guys, um, so each of you to give some last remarks, but while you're thinking about what you might want to say, because we're going to close it down soon, um, I do want to just point out, so no, very few people seem to know this in the United States, but um, so to earn your PhD in, in you know, power engineering or electrical engineering or computer engineering, um, you apply for graduate school, and if you're accepted for a, a research project, the, the university, and especially, you know, like Chewy, right, the contracts he's bringing in from funding agencies, from federal funding agencies, because the work he's doing is important to protecting our national security, right? Chewy's, Chewy's research contracts are paying you to go to grad school. You know, US citizens, you know, are especially like helpful here because sometimes the the the, the work um, has a security component. So if anyone's listening who's contemplating a PhD, I encourage you to apply. You don't have to have a 4.0 to get into grad school, folks. You got to have at least a 3.0. And so I encourage you because your tuition is paid and you're paid a stipend and you have some health benefits. So you can actually do it without taking out any more loans. That's how I went to grad school. I graduated with my bachelor's degree. I had done a little bit of research. I, my advisor explained this to me and that's why I got my PhD. Nobody else in my family had a PhD, you know? So I think more, more and more people need to understand that it, what you want is a curious mind who wants to experiment with recipes as Chewy was just saying, right? So, you know, uh, and um, I enjoyed my PhD more than my undergraduate degree, so. I encourage anybody out there listening who's thinking about a graduate degree to just apply. Well, and so Juno, let's start with you. And um, I would love some concluding remarks. I mean, I know you guys met each other in Ireland. I know you have no shared language except English. Oh yeah, that's right. right? And so 
you guys are great friends and I'm, I'm really glad that you were able to join us from University of Michigan. Oh yeah, yeah, thanks for that. So um, I think the tree did a really great presentation today and uh, he already uh, pointed out the, uh, many, po uh, many uh, the, the points that uh, the power grid, um, actually it's not ready for the cybersecurity uh, right now. That's why we still need to do a lot of research and also need to think about how we can be prepared for the uh, potential cyber attacks in the futures. Just for example, you know, as she mentioned uh, in the Ukraine cyber attacks, and nobody was not sure uh, whether the cyber attackers, they can get into their um, the, the control center, those communication networks. So nobody can sure until that actually happens. So. I think that we also need to be prepared uh, for the US power grid. Uh, so we need to think about you know, what kind of potential vulnerabilities or cyber threats uh, that we need to uh, think about. And that way uh, we can also um, need to do uh, um, uh, like planning for the mitigation actions. And also we also, the, one of the very important thing is since I'm uh, working in the university, I think uh, it is really important that we need to uh, have, you know, uh, like many students who can understand these topics. And also we need to encourage them to understand, you know, uh, all these uh, new uh, issues that we can see in the futures. I agree. All right, Chewy, you get to close it down with closing remarks. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining Michigan Tech's College of Engineering Husky Bites. Uh, and so, Chewy, take it from here. Um, so, future is on ours. Please consider opportunity when you are younger. And, you know, um, life is very different at work. And if you decide you want to come back for a PhD, you're always welcome. Um, you know, I never thought I want to be a professor, but I realized that is every single step I uh, walked through it with a different mentor I met and their insight about the career trajectory make a difference in me. So, um, and I thanks them for all the opportunity uh, to give me an opportunity today to educate all of you. Um, and I, I feel that, um, it's the same thing, even if, if you decide to work in industry, uh, that's still fine. You, you know, thing doesn't work out. You can always look for something different. And uh, for me is I, I, I left ac academia after I'd received a master's and then I go to Singapore to work for four years with a multinational company. I get to travel around the world. Um, I, I learned a lot from that process, but then I also realized that um, I want to, spread my passion and if, what if I want to teach in college what take me there um, today you need a PhD to be able to teach in college um, it's not like in the you know old time so all a lot of this is really one step at a time and determine what you want and um, particularly today when you have an opportunity of scholarship grab it you have an opportunity to get to the master's with uh, a shortened year with an accelerated program grab it because I think that the gap between what we have in American system as compared with uh, the system I came from, you, the Britain system, is that a lot of, uh, in the first few years in the American system, we put a lot of effort on diversity, humanity, and all that, um, make us have less accessible to elective course. And I think it is the elective courses that make you marketable. And mm -hmm. so that's why we have a lot of power engineers from Michigan Tech before they graduate, they take all these elective courses and then they got a job hired and, and they, are, uh, they, they have every knowledge they need to be successful at work, so. Well, there you go. I didn't mean for you to end it with a, you know, a, a commercial for Michigan Tech, but we do <laughs> high quality engineers. And, and I just want to commend you both for your passion. For, I mean, it's evident your passion for your field is evident in everything you say. And so thank you so much for sharing your, evening with us and for teaching us about um, about our grid. It, 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 I learned a lot. Thank you so much and thank you everyone. Um, there is no Husky Bites webinar next week. We're taking an early spring break but we start the week after and we're going to be talking about above and below the Mackinac Bridge. So looking forward to seeing you guys there. Good evening. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you yeah. Bye-bye.